Good afternoon and welcome to another Waukegan History Museum History Lunch and Learn. My name is Ty Rohr. I'm the manager of cultural arts for the Waukegan Park District and also work on behalf of the Waukegan Historical Society. First off, I hope everyone is doing well out there today. We're halfway through May and I'll continue to do these history lunch and learns every week on Fridays at noon through the rest of the Illinois stay at home order. After we're back to a little more uh, normalcy, I will continue to do the history lunch and learns through Facebook Live uh, because it's been a lot of fun to be able to reach out beyond just the local community to share our Waukegan stories. Now, first off, I want to uh, kind of recognize newspapers. Uh, without newspapers, it would be very hard for us historians to tell a lot of the stories that we share. Um, something like today's program, uh, without having some of the newspaper resources, we just wouldn't really know very much. Um, unfortunately, right now, I don't have, re, uh, or I, I'm sorry, I don't have access to all of the newspapers. Uh, so some stories like our presidential visits to Waukegan, and Waukegan has had a few visits. Um, unfortunately, I, I don't know much about what they were doing. Now, most likely these were quick whistle-stop tours in Waukegan. Uh, the, the president stopping uh, with their trains um, as they are traveling between Milwaukee and Chicago. Um, but again, it, these are stories that are covered, I'm sure, in the newspapers. Um, and sometime I'll be able to dig back into those and find out exactly what did happen. Um, but without newspapers, it'd be very hard for us to tell some of these stories. So thank you to those folks, the reporters, the people that work behind the scenes uh, with the various newspapers in the past uh, to help us today in the present and the future to understand uh, what was going on in history. Now, I know many of us have been dreaming of places that we want to visit once it is safe to do so. So for today's program, I have decided to share some stories of famous people who have come to visit Waukegan. Now, I know it's not the same as going out and traveling, but we'll still have some fun with it. I'm not covering everyone that has made an appearance in Waukegan during today's uh, story. For the most part, I'm skipping entertainers who have come to Waukegan, folks like Glenn Miller, Benny Goodman, uh, to some more recent uh, visitors like David Copperfield and Jerry Seinfeld. I'm not talking about those folks today. I'm not even going to talk about uh, famous Waukeganites who have returned back home, uh, nor am I talking about athletes that have come into Waukegan to play or to sign autographs. I'm not even talking about Michael Jordan driving up to Waukegan to play golf at Glen Flora Country Club today. Because basically that's the entire story right there. But sit back, relax, and enjoy the stories that I have chosen for you today about some of the famous folks who have come to Waukegan. So we start with our first and most, uh, well, maybe not our most famous visitors, but definitely the first. So we have uh, Marquette, uh, Father Jacques Marquette and Louis Joliet exploring on behalf of New France for the crown of France. Um, and Marquette and Joliet, they, leave from New France, today's uh, Quebec and Canada, um, and in the, the Michigan area, uh, Sault Ste. Marie, uh, and then they uh, start traveling, heading to find for France 
uh, this river that they had learned about uh, from uh, Native Americans. And Marquette and Joliet on this expedition in 1673, they find this great river, the Mississippi River, and they travel down the Mississippi for a bit to see where it is going. Uh, France is hoping uh, that this will be uh, a great river heading to the west that would uh, open up uh, some new opportunities. Uh, but Marquette and Joliet uh, find that the Mississippi River travels south going into the Gulf of Mexico. Not what France wanted. Well, Marquette and Joliet, on their return trip back to New France, uh, they cut across the state using the Illinois River, uh, connecting to the Chicago Portage and travel north up Lake Michigan. Uh, they do make a stop on the shores of present day Waukegan in September of 1673, according to their diaries and journals. So our first uh, famous visitor is 1673, and it's the visit of Marquette and Joliet on their expedition uh, to find the Mississippi River. Uh, this is a program that I may do in the future. Um, there's a lot to this story. It's really a very interesting story. Uh, so I'll just leave, uh, leave it at that for today. Here is our most famous visitor, Abraham Lincoln. I bet most of you have heard this story before. I have uh, probably done it a few hundred times. Uh, especially for the school group kids. Um, basically, Lincoln uh, comes or is invited to Waukegan uh, to give a speech. This is before he is president, uh, but at this point there are some grumblings, some talk that he could possibly be nominated for the Republican ticket um, early on for vice president, but as we know later on for president. But Lincoln comes to Waukegan on April 2nd, 1860. Now there's a lot to the story, of course. Whenever Lincoln is, is involved, strange, unique things happened. These Lincoln lore stories as we know them today. And Waukegan has a few of these. And I'll probably tell this story another time for everyone as well. Um, basically, Lincoln uh, gives the speech or attempts to. It is interrupted by a fire down at a warehouse down on the lakefront. Uh, but Lincoln is here that one night, April 2nd, 1860. And this is a month and a half before the Republican National Convention takes place in Chicago, where they do ultimately nominate him to uh, lead their ticket for the 1860 presidential race. This will be the shortest amount of time that I have ever talked Abraham Lincoln. Speaking of that 1860 presidential race, the American politician, U.S. Senator from Illinois, Stephen A. Douglas, the little giant, he also made an appearance in Waukegan in 1860. And actually, the appearance in 1860 was his second time visiting Waukegan. He had been uh, in the city in 1858 as well. Um, in 1860, he too is campaigning for the 1860 presidential election. He is representing the Northern Democratic Party, and he is really the main opponent to Lincoln in that race. Now in 1858, Douglas came to speak to the people of Waukegan and he found the folks at that point to be uh, very supportive of him and what he was saying. But when he, re when he returns to Waukegan in 1860, he finds that the climate has changed, their support is towards Lincoln, and it was not the warm reception that he was hoping that he was going to get up in Northeast Illinois. Now, 
I remembered back when I was helping to figure out what pictures to use for Ed Link's book, Waukegan A History. Well, basically, I decided to go through and look at every picture in our archives. So that's like eight to 10,000 pictures. And along the way, a few of these pictures stood out. Um, I, I knew that we couldn't fit them all into the book, but there were gonna be a few that some way, somehow, I was hoping that I could share the story. And one picture that I remembered uh, was this picture here showing Tom Thumb and his wife. And on the back side of the picture, it says Tom Thumb and wife in Waukegan at fairgrounds. Um, we actually have this photo in our collection twice. Uh, one with the date 1876, the other with the date 1886. Now, I really don't know much about the story uh, of Tom Thumb, so I did look a few things up here for us today. Um, his original name was Charles Stratton. He was an American entertainer who was around three feet in height. He was discovered by P.T. Barnum, who helped make Stratton an international celebrity. He married Lavinia Warren in 1863, and they toured together for various events around the world and really became uh, very famous um, and very wealthy uh, from, their, from their touring and entertaining. So Tom Thumb coming to Waukegan for an event at the fairgrounds seems very plausible and logical. Uh, the problem is the date. Uh, the 1886 date on one of the photographs, well, that is three years after, uh, after Charles Stratton's passing, so that wouldn't work. Um, the 1876 date would be just fine. Um, that fits in with uh, the fairgrounds being called fairgrounds at that point. Uh, but still, really through the rest of the 1800s, the fairgrounds are known as that by most of the local citizens. Um, so this is one of those stories that hopefully I can do a little newspaper archaeology at some point, see if it was ever uh, referenced within the newspapers to find out what was happening. Um, and doing some research, it looks like there may have been some other Tom Thumbs uh, that kind of popped up after the fact as well as entertainers. Um, so don't really know, but uh, this is a unique photograph in our archives. It's a photograph that was a publicity photograph uh, from New York, uh, but then collected by whoever it was that uh, donated it to the society with some captions on the back. But like so many stories, you, uh, you find one thing, and then, then it just opens up uh, to more and more questions. It's the fun thing about history. Uh, the research part is always exciting. You never know what you'll find, how long it will take. But also it's frustrating because, well, sometimes you never find what you're looking for. And in our case right now, well, you also don't necessarily have the capabilities to go do as much research as you would like. Here we have the first president to visit Waukegan, Rutherford B. Hayes, the 19th president, and he was here in 1878. Uh, fortunately, I don't know much about uh, his visit, but I'm assuming it is one of those whistle-stop train visits that many other presidents uh, did throughout the country and also locally here too. But. We do have a lot of information on when William McKinley visited as president in 1899. I happen to have the newspaper article with me right here. I'll read a portion of it. Our distinguished guest, Waukegan, gives a rousing welcome to the president, greeted by cheering thousands. Now I'm going to show you a picture of the cheering thousands. It's one of my favorite 
in our archives. I think I say that almost every uh, presentation with these lunch and learns. Here's a favorite picture. I guess I have a few. Um, we don't have a picture of McKinley uh, standing on the back of his train. This is a whistle stop uh, train uh, stop. Um, but we do have a picture from McKinley's perspective looking out at the audience. And here it is. So there are the cheering thousands uh, there to see McKinley. So here from the newspaper article. Um, October 21st, 1899. It was a grand demonstration, one befitting the honor bestowed upon our beautiful and patriotic city by the nation's chief magistrate in according a quarter of an hour of his time to our citizens. And it is, it is doubtful few cities of equal size have more thoroughly displayed their patriotism and devotion to the president upon a like occasion. At an early hour, people began to flock into town from the country and two hours before the scheduled time of the president's train. The multitude began to gather at the decorated platform at the depot, which awaited the arrival of the city's guest. At 12.15, the Lake Camp MWA band marched to the depot, escorting the 18,000 school children of the city and these under the guidance of Professor Kramer and their teachers were grouped about this stand, extending back of them to the limit of the open space and trailing back up the hills towards the heart of the city stood a solid bank of humanity numbering fully 12,000 while the roofs of adjacent buildings bore added numbers of enthusiastic people. The band played patriotic airs and hundreds of people waved flags making an animated scene. Just before the time scheduled for the arrival of the president's train, a wave of enthusiasm was engendered by the arrival of a highly decorated engine drawing a solitary car, which was sent over the line in advance of a precautionary measure. The crowd mistook it for the special and a ringing cheer arose that uh, with enthusiasm of the people. Soon, however, the special train appeared, and as soon as the, brilliantly, uh, the brilliant locomotive was caught by the eyes of the people, a mighty cheer arose that did not subside until some time after President McKinley took his station beneath the huge flag that canopied the platform. Just as the president stepped from the rear platform of the train, the band struck up hail to the chief, and played lustily, but beyond the opening bars of the familiar strain, the players' efforts were well nigh lost in the uproar of cheering that rose from the thousands of throats as Mr. McKinley stood bowing before the sea of eager, expectant faces. The arrival of the train was at 12.55 o'clock. In the last of the seven coaches sat the president, his cabinet, and the members of the local reception committee. As the train stopped, the president alighted and, and leaning on the arm of Mayor Pierce and escorted by Congressman Foss, ascended to the flag the decked platform. Instantly, the music ceased, and as the cheering died away, the president, hat in hand, stepped to the railing with Mayor Pierce. Mayor Pierce, in introducing the president, said, Mr. President, in behalf of the people here assembled, it is with the greatest pleasure I now extend to you a most hearty welcome. The time which you can remain with us is too precious to permit of any extended welcome. Therefore, with your permis permission, I will now introduce you to those who have come here to see and hear their honored president. Ladies, gentlemen, and children, I now have the honor of presenting to you the Honorable William McKinley, President of the United States of America. Give him a hearty welcome. And then McKinley gives an address from the train platform. I won't read that to you today. It's a pretty typical little stump speech. But here we get to the end. Now goodbye, and God bless you all. And it was followed with a huge applause. At the conclusion of the address, three hearty cheers were given, 
and escorted by the mayor, Waukegan's distinguished guest again entered his private car. As the train started, he stood upon the rear platform, bowing and waving his handkerchief until the train became a speck in the distance. Simultaneous to the train's departure, the factory whistles blew a farewell salute. The band struck up America, and the 1,800 school children sang the nation's hymn. So that was a pretty cool little event, especially for all those kids uh, to gather and uh, sing to William McKinley, President of the United States. Ah, here we have one of our common misconceptions within Waukegan, that Waukegan is the birthplace of actor Vincent Price. Um, Vincent Price, you probably know him for some of his performances in uh, different horror films, uh, films like ha House on Haunted Hill, House of Wax, The Last Man on Earth. He is the uh, spooky voice uh, speaking in Michael Jackson's thriller. Um, Quite, quite the Hollywood icon. And the confusion is that he is named after his father who is named after his grandfather. So here we see the picture of the actor Vincent L. Price Jr. along with his grandfather, Dr. Vincent Clarence Price. Dr. Price, born in 1832, was the inventor of cream baking powder so he starts really his own empire with the baking powder company, also has, uh, sells flavoring extracts, has a cereal company, uh, has perfumes. So he really had an empire of a lot of different things. Uh, he sent his son Vincent L. to St. Louis uh, to become the vice president of the National Candy Company. And it's in St. Louis where the actor was born. But uh, Vincent Price did visit Waukegan, uh, visit his uh, grandfather um, and grandfather's estate. Uh, so he did come to Waukegan for sure. Uh, the Vincent Price, the Dr. Vincent Price homes are still standing in Waukegan. Uh, you can see the main home right here at 719 Grand Avenue. Um, and then on this property, there are other large homes that the doctor built for his family. Uh, so they all live very close to each other in Waukegan in these large, uh, large mansions, really. Uh, so you can go down Grand Avenue and still see the Dr. Price uh, homes or homestead today. With Jane Adams, I did feature this story prominently uh, as I talked about the Bowen Country Club. So if you'd like to learn a lot more about that story, uh, you can find that history lunch and learn on the Waukegan History Museum Facebook page in the videos section. Uh, but Jane Adams' first visit to Waukegan was Thanksgiving Day in 1911. She arrived with Mrs. Louise de Coven Bowen and was shown a beautiful piece of property in Waukegan by Mayor Fred Buck, who owned that land. Jane Adams and Mrs. Bowen had been searching for the perfect place for the whole house to be able to start a summer camp for the underprivileged immigrant children of the whole house neighborhood. They found their spot Thanksgiving Day, 1911, and for the next 50 years, the Bowen Country Club operated on the grounds. Today, that site is known as Bowen Park, uh, but its legacy goes back to Jane Adams and Mrs. Bowen, two very special visitors to uh, Waukegan. Now, after the camp opens, Jane Adams does visit. Um, in the picture there uh, where she is seated, she is actually 
um, on the porch of the Waukegan History Museum there. Uh, so next time you come to visit our museum and you're on our porch entering, well, you are right there where Jane Addams spent just a little bit of time uh, probably watching some birds or maybe watching the kids play as she has uh, binoculars in her hands there. Aviator Max Lilly. Well, he was one of the famed early aviators, uh, had his Wright Brothers style airplane. And well, the big occasion was 4th of July weekend, 1913. One man, one woman was going to get to ride with Max Lilly in his plane. And for many in Waukegan, this is also gonna be the very first time that they were gonna see an airplane up close, or maybe even at all. So for one penny, uh, people could vote and vote as often as you wanted on who would win uh, the honor to ride with Max Lilly. Hilda Palo was chosen and she was the first to ride that day. Uh, they're up in the air and actually the plane stalls. Uh, luckily though, Lilly was able to get the plane uh, engine back running again and landed safely, but that was the only flight for the day. And I do cover the story in a little more detail again in a different history lunch and learn uh, the one uh, influential women uh, from Waukegan's past. Uh, but Max Lilly and his uh, Wright Brothers style plane were uh, definitely uh, very interesting and famous visitors that thousands came to witness uh, for that 4th of July weekend. This is the only sports reference, I think, that I have in this program. Um, but it's pretty cool when the Chicago Cubs and the Chicago White Sox come to town. And both teams came to play uh, the local boys here. On August 6th, 1914, as part of a Waukegan Day celebration, the Chicago White Sox came to town to face the local boys. The Daily Gazette heralded it as the first major league exhibition game ever held in the history of Waukegan. And the Sox overwhelmed the locals by a score of 13 to one. Not to be outdone, the Chicago Cubs came the following year for an exhibition game and won nine to three. The Cubs would come at another time uh, to honor uh, Waukegan's Bob O'Farrell and also uh, Arnold Jigger stats in just another exhibition game too. Here we have another presidential visit. This one by President Woodrow Wilson in 1916, addressing a crowd at Waukegan with 9,000 school children and men and women there to greet him. It's another uh, event just like when McKinley came where uh, the school kids got up that day uh, to be part of this historic event. Another presidential visit, this one, President Calvin Coolidge in 1925. That's all I have on that. <laughs> Sorry, President Coolidge. Definitely a very famous name and face here in this picture, Al Capone next to Johnny Torrio. I featured this story last week of Al Capone in Waukegan. Uh, so please go back and watch that video. But basically, uh, Johnny Torrio, he's in prison. Um, he's at the Lake County Jail. He's head of, uh, of the Chicago gang at that point um, with Al Capone uh, working for him. Uh, but Capone coming to Waukegan to visit Torrio to keep the operations running. And uh, well, some 
it's a unique story uh, leading up to the point where both Capone and Torrio find themselves in Waukegan. So if you haven't uh, watched or heard that Lunch and Learn, I, I do recommend that one. FBR had a whistle stop visit in 1934. And now the main event of today's history lunch and learn, Amelia Earhart's visit to Waukegan. On Monday evening, October 14th, 1935, where she came to speak on behalf of the Young Women's Christian Association to a huge crowd at Waukegan Township High School. But special treat for everyone today, I'm not telling the story, Betsy Alleman is. Yesterday, I interviewed Betsy, it was quite an honor. Uh, she is a great supporter of the Waukegan Historical Society and Waukegan history in general, and Waukegan. A uh, lifetime member of the society. Uh, when I started uh, in Waukegan in 2006, she was a member of the Historical Society board still, and she still volunteers for the society and serves on our museum committee. So it's quite an honor to uh, talk to Betsy about her experience that day when Amelia Earhart came to Waukegan. So here, let's listen to that interview. So Betsy, to kind of set the scene for everybody, October 14th, 1935, now I know that you're 39 now, how old were you in 1935? I was 10 years old. 10 years, okay. 10 years old. <clears throat> and I was just thrilled to be able to meet my hero. <laughs> well, tell me about that night. Take us through it. Uh... Well, she, the meeting was in the gymnasium at the high school on Jackson Street, and the room was just crowded. <clears throat> My aunt, uh, Martha and Ethel, were members of the YWCA, and they were sponsoring the speech. And because Ethel was on the committee, I got a front row seat and got to be right there to, uh, to watch her. And I was absolutely thrilled because she had been my hero for years. I wanted to be just like her. I listened and read and tried to hear everything I could about her flying adventures, and I wanted to be Amelia Earhart when I grew up. I don't remember everything that she talked about in her speech, but I probably just sat there in a daze actually seeing my hero. I remember that she, taught, she told about the first time that she crossed the Atlantic when she was nothing but baggage on the plane. She had to just sit on the floor very uncomfortably while the men flew the plane. But the second time she did it by herself and was the first woman to do it. And it was exactly five years after Lindbergh had crossed the ocean that she did. And she had quite a few problems on the flight, the fire and losing her altitude and everything, but she made it. And so of course I was thrilled about that. I think the whole world was listening and to the radio and trying to figure out if she was going to get there. So, <clears throat> so she talked. Sorry. Pardon? Go, go, keep going. Oh, she talked about uh, flying the auto gyro. That was a a plane, a strange plane. It was like an airplane with a big rotor on top of it, with wings. And she flew that all around the country while she was barnstorming to give her speeches. And I don't know if she flew that into Waukegan or not. I don't remember. I don't know that I was um, aware of it at the time, but I don't remember. But I know that she did fly that back and forth 
and she gave speeches all over everywhere. So she went all over the country giving her speeches. Um, she was really the um, spokeswoman for women being allowed to fly. And uh, <clears throat> oh, I don't know what else to say. Well, so you're you're sitting there in the front row. Yes. Were you sitting next to friends of yours? I don't remember who I was with. I I don't. I think I was just there, probably sitting next to my aunt. But um, I really I really don't remember. I was just in awe, absolutely in awe. And I thought she was beautiful, and she looked beautiful, and she was wonderful. <clears throat> and then when, when she got lost, I was just absolutely desolated. I, I cried, and then I followed everything I could while they were hunting for her, and I still do that to this day. I save every article that comes out about some thought of where she might be or somebody might found her bones or something like that. So while she's giving the speech, uh, were people like laughing along at some of the stuff she said? Were they clapping, applauding, or were people just kind of quiet during out? Do you remember? I I don't remember. I I know that that there was laughter and and clapping. Yeah. I I think that she was a was just a woman's liver, and that that meant a lot to. Uh, all the all the ladies in the audience, but the audience wasn't just women. It was uh, it was a mixed audience. The gymnasium was filled. So, did you get to meet her after the speech separately? Yes, I did, and uh, I I don't remember what I said to her or anything because I I was just. I probably just stood there with my mouth open like a dummy, but um, yes, I did get to meet her, and it's one of the biggest thrills of my life. <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, that, that's awesome. Yeah, you, even uh, even today, I have some of this paperwork out on our dining room table, and my wife saw uh, the advertisement for the event, and she said, 50 cents? I'll, I'll pay to go see Amelia Earhart for 50 cents, and we would pay a whole lot more to go see Amelia Earhart, wouldn't we? I mean, that, that'd be, I, I would love to, to have experienced that. Uh, it, was, it was wonderful. She was, she was just such a lot of fun, and she had told about her life and all, and, and uh, she was quite, quite wonderful. I wish I'd learned to fly. <laughs> As I told you before, there's still time. <laughs> well, I hope so. <laughs> that would be nice. <clears throat> well, anything else from that day or that evening you'd like to uh, share with everybody? You know, I don't. I don't remember too much more that I can say about that night. Um, it was just the high point of my life, I know, and, and it was probably one of the best things that ever, you know, that I ever got to do. I don't know that anything after that was quite as uh, meaningful and wonderful to me. Um, I just followed her life uh, ever since then, and still... I'm interested in it. I I I just I just loved her. <laughs> well, Betsy, thank you for sharing uh, your story of getting to meet Amelia Earhart when she came to Washington. Uh, great story, and it's awesome that you got to see your childhood uh, idol uh, right there in the front row, and then meeting her after that too. Uh, thank you again for sharing that story. So I was glad to do it. Thank you. So that was Betsy Elliman's first hand account. Love talking to Betsy about that. Uh, 
we actually, as our second time, we, we tried to interview the first time. The recording equipment didn't work. We tried that back when the stay-at-home order uh, uh, went into effect. And Betsy is a wealth of knowledge of all Amelia Earhart things. Uh, I think that interview we spoke for at least an hour. Um, but it's great to uh, talk to her again yesterday to uh, get her story and her remembering of meeting Amelia when she came to Waukegan. So thank you again, Betsy, for uh, that wonderful experience and sharing your story with us. So back to me again, sorry. Uh, we, got, we have Dorothy Lamore in 1939. Now, I said I wasn't going to do entertainers, and technically, uh, Dorothy Moore is back in Waukegan in 1939 to be part of the world premiere of Man About Town, starring Jack Benny. Uh, so Dorothy the Moore was in that movie as well. So here you see her in the car for uh, the parade that was happening for uh, that uh, unique Waukegan event. But actually, this was the second time that Dorothy L'Amour was in Waukegan. She actually had been in Waukegan earlier in May of 1935 when she got married to Herbie K. Yeah, she got married to Herbie K in Waukegan. Waukegan has had a few uh, different celebrity weddings, Jack Benny and Sadie Marks to be one of them, but Dorothy the Moore and Herbie K, uh, the, the band leader, uh, getting married in 1935. Speaking of famous weddings for famous visitors, Jean Harlow, well, she was attending Ferry Hall in Lake Forest at the time, and she comes up to Waukegan with Charles McGrew and gets married to him on September 21st, 1927. Uh, Jean Harlow, known as Harlene Carpenter at the time. Um, the unique thing about this story is that uh, Jean Harlow had claimed that she was 19 years old on the marriage license, but she was actually 16. Um, but another visitor uh, to Waukegan, Jean Harlow, uh, getting married in uh, 1927. This was a brand new one that I just found in our archives uh, this week. Uh, didn't really know such a thing really existed, but this is Ruth Shaw. She is the originator of finger painting. So here she was in Waukegan in 1944. She was a guest of the local USO. And from a newspaper article, it says a touch of the dramatic, a combination of ingenuity and self-expression lends an amazing appeal to finger painting among servicemen at Sheridan Road, USO. And particularly so when it is being demonstrated by the artist who originated the idea. While the lads crowded around her with interest and curiosity, Miss Ruth Fazenshaw, artist and educator last evening, demonstrated the simple art of finger painting. With free and easy strokes, she ran her fingers across the paper stretch, here a flourish, there a little twist of the wrist, a quick short stroke and a long sweeping movement, which ended with a couple of quick dabs. So it goes in kind of the story of how she uh, develops uh, finger painting. Um, basically, um, when she is uh, working at a private school in Rome, uh, I don't remember if it's her or somebody else, uh, cuts their finger while painting, and some of the, the blood gets onto uh, a wall as they're going someplace to clean up their hands, and it just kind of looks like artwork. And from there, the students then start uh, using their fingers to kind of uh, not move 
blood around, but, <laughs> but paint, and uh, then it becomes an art expression. And going to the end of the article, uh, you see she was visiting the, the local USO because she had heard that uh, finger painting had been incorporated there. It was uh, a technique to uh, help the servicemen uh, there to, to calm nerves, uh, to entertain. Uh, so she came to the, the local USO. Um, said Miss Shaw too had heard about the finger painting at Sheridan Road USO when she was in Sampson, New York. In the Navy hospital there, a young sailor told Miss Shaw about the many happy hours he had spent in Waukegan. Waukegan is noted for two things, was the boy's deduction, Jack Benny and the finest USO in the country. General Douglas MacArthur, he was in town in 1951. An estimated 75,000 people turned out to cheer General, the General of the Army, Douglas MacArthur. Mac was on a triumphal tour of the nation shortly after returning to the United States. The legendary hero of World War II in the Pacific had been fired shortly before by President Harry Truman. In the car with MacArthur is Robert Coulson, then mayor of Waukegan. Uh, the picture was taken um, outside of the Lake County Jail. But Mac was in town. Another new one, uh, at least for me, maybe some of you out there knew this one already. Uh, Colonel James Irwin came to speak to the students at the Waukegan High School. Uh, Irwin was the eighth man to walk on the surface of the moon. Uh, so he was a part of Apollo 15. And by this point in 1972, um, he was working for the Johns Manville Corporation, going around and speaking in communities that had uh, factories uh, like Waukegan's John Manville plant. So here he is uh, signing some autographs uh, for some of the students there at the high school. But what a great treat for those kids to be able to meet uh, an astronaut and uh, one of the few to actually walk on the moon. He's not the last astronaut to visit Waukegan though. I'll talk about another one here in just a few minutes. And <laughs> another new one for me. Another Colonel came for a visit to Waukegan. This Colonel though, more of the honorary title type. Colonel Sanders was here in 1975. <laughs> So Colonel Sanders um, was basically touring the country, um, advertising his company, his company and his brand, his himself basically. Um, this picture though was taken in Waukegan where he was uh, in town uh, meeting people and signing autographs. So Colonel Sanders was here, 1975. Um, up until this week, I thought President Ford was a famous visitor to Waukegan. Um, nope, he, he never made it to Waukegan, actually. Um, he was in the Northern Illinois region um, in 1976, um, but he actually doesn't visit, but he calls Waukegan. So he calls a group that's assembled um, at the Swedish Glee Club for an event, for a political event. Um, <laughs> so I, I kept him in still. He's, he, I guess he, he visited in a way, uh, but just not in person. And the picture you see there was taken at Woodfield Mall. So he calls uh, Waukegan when he is en route to Woodfield Mall from uh, downtown Chicago.
And Barack Obama, he uh, made a visit to Waukegan in 2005. This was right after he was uh, sworn in as Illinois Senator. So Obama came to City Hall and he spoke to around 250 people, uh, really sharing his uh, political platform. Um, really, people were at that point just starting to get to know who he was. And if anybody has been paying attention to uh, the ESPN documentary, The Last Dance, well, you've probably already gotten a chuckle at the way that I, uh, I put in the description for Barack Obama, former Chicago resident. There was a lot of talk a couple weeks ago about that unique description when you could say so many things about Barack Obama where you should probably start with presidents. Well, in that documentary, the first time he's introduced, he's introduced as former Chicago resident. <laughs> So I decided, hey, let's keep it going. And I end today with a very recent famous visitor, uh, famous visit. This was uh, last um, August 22nd, 2019 for the spectacular unveiling of the Ray Bradbury statue outside of the Waukegan Public Library. And part of that unveiling ceremony, Waukegan was honored to have Captain James Lovell come to be a part and to speak. Uh, so Captain Jim Lovell of Apollo 13, yes, he came, he came up and he uh, gave some wonderful uh, remarks to help unveil that Bradbury statue. And with Bradbury being so instrumental to inspiring uh, astronauts, it was quite the honor to have one of the greats in our presence that day, that evening. And he is the only one out of this list of folks that I actually got to meet. So there we have it. On behalf of the Waukegan Park District and the Waukegan Historical Society, thank you again for joining me for another Waukegan History Museum Lunch and Learn. Special thanks again to Betsy Alleman for sharing her firsthand story of Amelia Earhart's visit. It was a true treat to get to talk to her and, uh, and share that with you all today. I will be on again next Friday at noon with another Waukegan history story. Don't know the topic yet, haven't thought about it, but I've got a few up my sleeve here, so we'll, we'll have a fun time again uh, next Friday. Everyone, please have a great weekend, and I look forward to talking about the past with you in the future. This is Ty Rohr signing off.